Good evening. Tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about the Cirrus of Provorst, and you see her here in an 1892 painting by Gabriel von Mox. Uh, this painting is in the Prague Museum. But before we begin that, I want to um, address a few quotations in order to give us time to assemble as a group. So, uh, I did have a number of uh, suggested quotations come in uh, from various subscribers, and so I thought I would uh, read some of them and uh, make a couple of comments. Uh, the first of these uh, comes from Sean, and he says, A man who lives in sin has no feeling about it, no relation to it. He only knows certain offenses against laws, which to other people would not be sins at all. Without freedom and responsibility, one even loses one's sense of sin. One only knows what one has offended against. One only knows that one has offended against the law. And obviously, in psychopathic personalities, uh, where they can't tell the difference between right and wrong, this is the case. Now, Dr. Young did write a letter on this, so I thought I would read his letter. Um, the quote that Sean sent us came from page 297 of the Zarathustra seminars. And by the way, I'll just point out that the um, the notes for tonight on the series of Provorst are available on the group Dropbox under handouts and then subfolder 11, 19, 18. And so you can download them all right to your computer if you like. I'll be working with those notes. And so anyway, here's, um, Here's a letter where Carl Jung on when intelligence couples with moral weakness. And this came from Louis LaFontaine, who's a very frequent publisher of Jungian material. He has this image along with the quote. Um, and this is a letter he wrote to one hair N on November 23rd, 1945. When moral weakness is coupled with a relatively good intelligence, as seems to be the case with you, one must use his intelligence when the ethical sense fails. This trite bit of wisdom cannot teach you any psychotherapy but you must understand it and simply apply it to yourself. If you can make this minimal use of your intelligence, you are saved. <laughs> Yours truly, C.G. Young. So the point is, if you're awake and somewhat intelligent, you can figure out the difference between right and wrong. Um, and Unfortunately, there are some people in our lives that don't um, have that level of moral intelligence. Uh, and then um, here's another quote from Sean. American women rule the home because the American men have not yet learned to love them. Sean's comment is, why this seems so true without knowing is the really weird part. I guess in our hearts, we know it's true. Okay, so uh, I challenge you to look around you around between 2 and 3 o'clock 
on Thanksgiving Day, and you might have a sense of this, because by that time, normally all the men are gathered around the television set watching other people have an authentic life in some football game or other, and all the women are out in the kitchen interacting with one another. And so that clearly shows that American men don't know how to appreciate and uh, understand the needs of American women very well. And uh, it's, uh, it's, some, it's a quandary that I always um, find very disturbing, but I, I don't know what to do about it. And sometimes I try to hang out with the women, but it doesn't always work very well. So anyway, um, it's, it's a quote that is definitely worth thinking about, and I'll read the quote to you once more. American women rule the home because the American men have not learned to love them. Um, and so I guess we, all American men need to reflect on that idea. It does seem strangely true. Now, another, um, let's see. Okay, so a couple of weeks back, I read a letter to a Frau N, and I don't know if this is the same Frau N, but anyway, um, Lewis has sent this through um, as uh, Carl Jung, quote, psychological treatment cannot rid you of the basic facts of your nature. And here he says, uh, it's to Dear Fraulein N, January 23rd, 1941. There is much that I do not understand in your letter. If you are suffering from an inferior extroversion, then that is a fact which is nobody's fault and for which you can hold nobody responsible. It is a difficulty which is rooted in your own nature and which you can only acknowledge in an attempt to do the best you can with it. Nor does it matter at all whether I have a high or low opinion of you. The only thing that matters is what you do yourself. Nobody can fence you in, as you put it. But people who have no money, for instance, are fenced in by that very fact without being able to hold anybody else responsible. There are a whole lot of facts in your letter which you'll have... There are a whole lot of facts in your letter which you'll just have to face up to instead of tracing them back to the faulty behavior of other people. Psychological treatment cannot rid you of the basic facts of your nature. It can only give you the necessary insight and only to the extent that you are capable of it. There are countless people with an inferior extroversion or with too much introversion or with too little money, who in God's name must plod along through life under such conditions. These conditions are not diseases, but normal difficulties of life. If you blame me for your psychological difficulties, it won't help you at all, for it is not my fault you have them. It's nobody's fault. I can't take these difficulties away from you, but have merely tried to make you aware of what you need in order to cope with them. If you could stop blaming other people and external circumstances for your own inner difficulties, you would have gained an infinite amount. But if you go on making others responsible, no one will have any desire to stand by you with advice. Yours sincerely, C.G. Jung. And that's from C.G. Young's Letters, Volume 1, page 292. And so uh, whenever you hear someone trying to pass the blame 
to someone else, you know that it's an inner difficulty that that person is happening and you might feel um, sorry for them. Uh, Thomas says, isn't that amazing how the men and women separate like that? I noticed it as a kid and wondered at it, especially, especially on holidays. Sean says, thanks for reading mine, haha. <laughs> Ryan, uh, Ryan Senator says, sorry, I can't join you. Will you make this available via recording later? Yes, it will be available in replay uh, shortly after we finish this evening. Sean says, I'm listening in the background. Okay, well, I think many people do listen in the background. It's not that the image on your screen is, <laughs> is that cool, I have to acknowledge. Um, yeah, so, anyway, um, let me prepare one thing, which is, there it is, okay, all right, so, um, I'm going to uh, cut short any other readings for now, since I see that we have uh, a quorum and uh, I'd like to uh, start on the cirrus. Um, now the this, um, but before I do that there's one other thing which is one subscriber commented that the dark side of self-improvement is an issue and um, he referred us to a um, A YouTube, or I'm sorry, uh, an internet uh, blog post called The Dark Side of Self Improvement. And so I will refer you to that. Uh, you can look at it at your leisure. Uh, the link is here. Um, and I do agree that there is a dark side to self improvement and that things like divination as we'll discuss this evening and other things are in a way taking advantage of us because uh, the only self-improvement that you can really have is by uh, examining yourself and knowing yourself quite well um, but in that article there is one, a good quote from uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti which is it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And by a sick society, I think he meant a society that is um, reliant upon materiality. Um, and uh, hello, Gonzalo from Argentina. Los saludo de Argentina. Uh, Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I was, uh, the very first seminar I did, I did on, um, on Periscope. Uh, and it so happened that I had a guest on that occasion from Argentina and that kept me going. I actually had 35 people on that Periscope uh, session that time, which was, uh, uh, about the middle of July of 2016. You can find it, the first session on, um, let's see, uh, JRG1 is the playlist, JRG1. Um, and so Jonathan Cabral says, great letter. I was just thinking about this topic the other day. We often are. And so now, to go on with the series of Prevorst. And the reason I want to is because in my lifetime, and especially when my maternal grandmother was alive um, and my maternal grandfather, uh, there were, was much discussion about things like ghosts and other things and so I've had quite a number of experiences along these lines and uh, I want to speak about those tonight but what 
what Dr. Young says, the bottom line of what he says, is that this case of the seeress, and she lived from 1801 to 1829, um, she is no by no means uncommon. It's very common, and many people have such experiences. And Thomas says, Artie Lang was one of my first favorite psychology writers. His work touches upon the problem Krishnamurti mentions. And uh, the problem that Krishnamurti mentions is also our problem um, in the sense that we're all chasing something, whether it's uh, I've got to get that house or I've got to get that boat or I really want a new car. Whatever it is, those are all material items. And when you get them, you, found, you find that they don't bring you happiness per se. You have to put life into those things to make, to give you happiness. So anyway, I've, I'm working tonight with this book, um, The History of Modern Psychology by C.G. Jung. Um, and this is from a series of lectures which were given at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology um, between 19, uh, well, these were these lectures that I'm talking about tonight were all given in 1933, and there were five of them, and Dr. Jung was talking about the development of modern psych psychology. I can highly recommend this book because he does uh, lay out the philosophical underpinnings, underpinnings of psychology that go back um, at least 500 years and before, uh, even back to Gnostics and Aristotelian and Platonic times. But, um, but he spent a lot of time on this case of the Cirrus, and as you'll hear in the fifth lecture that he did on her, uh, by then he was getting uh, complaints from the audience. And he had four to six hundred people showing up every Friday evening f for a one-hour lecture. And I suppose that that wouldn't happen today because today he would be doing what I'm doing, I suppose. Um, but in those days, because they didn't have access to this kind of um, media and because um, Dr. Jung hadn't published all his work yet, especially in 1933, um, they really had to come and physically hear him. And of course, there was great interest in psychology. And one of the things that people were complaining about in letters to him between the set Fridays was that he wasn't talking about current events. And of course, um, the rise of Adolf Hitler was quite, um, quite the thing at this particular point of time. Uh, and I think that what he was trying to do was to make some comments that people could use uh, without expressly uh, attacking Hitler himself, because if he had done, he might easily have been uh, murdered in the way um, our Saudi Arabian journalist was murdered in Turkey recently. And so he had to be quite careful. He lived in a country surrounded by the Axis powers uh, during World War II, and of course this was coming up in 1933, and he had already been through World War I, so he was very careful to be circumspect, circumspect about what he was saying. And so uh, tonight I'm referring to uh, lectures 5 through 9 from the History of Modern Psychology, and so this is five hours of lecture material. I'm hoping to get through it in just two hours, less than two hours. 
And so I apologize if I don't, if I only get halfway through, then we'll continue next week. Okay, so Dr. Jung used as his text, The Series of Provorst by Justinus Kerner. And he said that it contains naive observations and interpretations. And Dr. Jung asked the audience not to ascribe these to him because Dr. Kerner was a medical doctor who was uh, seeing Mrs. Uh, Hauf. Um, yeah, her name is Hauf, Frederica Hauf. Uh, he was seeing her for uh, physical health issues and she started to talk to him and so he was recording these and ultimately uh, recorded them in a book which he published entitled The Series of Provorce. But what Dr. Jung emphasizes here is that he, that book was by no means a complete uh, study, case study from a psychological or a psychiatric point of view. So he had to infer quite a bit from it. But anyway, what he said is that she had a normal, healthy, and happy childhood, that some of her siblings had fits, but they were not epileptic fits. And he does mention that at this point in time, there was a lot of scurvy in that part of Germany, uh, because remember, it wasn't until the year he was giving these talks, 1933, that the cause of scurvy was realized, and the cause of scurvy being the inadequate uh, access to vitamin C. So if you don't have enough vitamin C, you're going to get scurvy. But 120 years earlier uh, in r rural Germany, that was completely unknown, and there weren't any um, oranges <laughs> growing in that part of Germany, maybe potatoes. And so the result is that people did have scurvy, and, and the, their physical health was affecting uh, their psychological health. And this, of course, would have been true in all the ages before that as well. And so uh, her grandfather had what was called second sight in Scotland. In other words, he could see events happening in Scotland. Uh, and many of these events actually came to be true. Uh, but no one knows how. And of course, this he was giving this lecture uh, some time after Dr. Jung himself had discovered the collective unconscious and um, had had similar second sight experiences himself. And those matters are covered in the Red Book, as you probably know. Um, so the Cirrus had a number of colorful and graphic dreams and these dreams often came true. And, uh, but he observes also that one time uh, Frederica was reproached by her father for misplacing an object, and she claimed that it was he that had misplaced it and did a seance to figure out where the item was and ultimately it was found. Her father found the item uh, based on her um, focusing on it. And uh, Jung says, well, of course, uh, she may have, have uh, planned this by hiding the object, knowing where it is, and then giving her father the impression that he, she had divined where it was. But also at a similar time, she was uh, working with hazel rods, and apparently she had become uh, quite a, a good and adept diviner. Now, I don't know anything about divining, but I do know that um, it is possible to do, and that people were doing it for thousands of years, and they were using hazel rods. Nowadays, I think they use uh, mechanical means, 
uh, for the same sort of thing, but uh, people who are very sensitive, who are very intuitive, um, are able to find water very often. Um, and also, uh, she couldn't sit in the choir loft of the church because it was directly over graves, and so she was afraid, apparently, of ghosts, and she was afraid ghosts would come up out of the graves that were beneath the chapel, and um, so she usually sat up in the balcony of the chapel because of that. Um, but she often stopped it uh, and going out for walks, she would often stop at a place where she said there was an ancient burial site. And uh, what I would say is that uh, ancient burial sites are very common in Western Europe. And uh, I even have the experience of a friend of mine who was building a home outside of Paris. And I was visiting him one day and they were uh, digging a hole to prepare to put a driveway in and they found human remains under the place where he was putting the driveway entirely unexpected that they would find human remains in that place but they did and the same thing happened to Dr. Young when he was starting to excavate for building the home that he built in Bollingen um, they found uh, ancient remains and he re he reburied them but i don't think it's very particularly astounding that she would be stop and say there are ancient remains there because europeans have been there for thousands of years and there are a lot of uh, a lot of dead people out there so um and as I say, I've physically seen that occur myself in an unexpected place. So um, now Dr. Young makes uh, one very interesting comment here on page 40. He says, um, quote, I imagine myself thinking in a dark room that it could be haunted. Then it is definitely not haunted. I thought it away. But if we do not entertain the thought, then it could well occur. And by that, he means an apparition coming out of the unconscious um, that would be a ghost. And uh, I would refer you back to uh, Jung's vision at the Cathedral of Basel, where he observed at age 11, um, God Almighty, God Almighty, uh, relieving himself on the roof of the Cathedral of Basel and destroying the cathedral. And that thought uh, had been coming up in his mind. He knew it was coming for three days, and he could not uh, imagine what the thought was going to be. But finally, he, it became so powerful that he couldn't stop it. And so he just let it come, and then, boom, he had this vision of God Almighty. Uh, and, um, and he said he felt complete bliss after he allowed that thought to come. And so I think that that might be an example where if you hold off a thought, uh, it can possibly find a way to get through to your consciousness um, anyway and be devastating. But if you just let the thought come, then, then it's not there in your psyche anymore waiting to ambush you. I mean, I think that's, that's my interpretation of what he's saying here. Um, but anyways, also talking about the grandfather's influence in connection with this, and one time, um, Frederica was at her grandfather's house, and she stepped into the hallway, and she saw an apparition in the hallway. She came back in to her grandfather's room, 
and he just brought her into the room and had her stay there and he just never let her alone in the hallway again and it turned out that he too had had visions of apparitions in that hallway um, but um, what Dr. Young's point here is that Dr. Kerner thought that she actually saw this ghost in the 1830s when he was writing his book but Dr. Young says telling people there, that there are not any ghosts is futile we have to meet them at their own level so what he's talking about is that uh, ghosts only exist in the psyche they don't exist in the physical world and so we need to understand how to deal with them in the physical world and um, so let me and I wanted to read to you this footnote on page of footnote 188 just a moment Okay, this, this footnote is about Dr. Young's travels to Africa. And it, um, anyway, it says, On Mount Elgin in East Africa, during a palaver, I incautiously uttered the word Salel to me, Salel to me, which means ghosts. Suddenly a death look Suddenly a deathly silence fell on the assembly. The men glanced away, looked in all directions, and some of them made off. My Somali headman and, a chief, and the chief confabulated together, and then the headman whispered in my ear, What did you say that for? Now you'll have to break up the palaver. Uh, this taught me that one must never mention ghosts on any account. And so uh, I hope I haven't broken up our palaver tonight <laughs> by mentioning ghosts. But uh, in my own life, I do uh, recall that uh, after my maternal grandmother died, my grandfather, and at that time I was eight years old, uh, my grandfather had visions of her coming to him twice. And at the time, I was interpreting what he was saying as these were ghosts, actual apparitions, and I thought that for quite some time. Um, but in the fullness of time, I've come to understand that at emotional times, uh, it's fairly common for um, apparitions to approach you f through the psyche. And when my own brother died in 1988, which was 30 years ago now, um, he actually came to me twice. And uh, the difference is that I knew that uh, these were visions that I was having from my own unconscious. And it's partially because and by that time, I had started to read Man and His Symbols, so I started to know in a very rudimentary way something about, um, about uh, Dr. Young and his teaching. And Thomas says, inasmuch as ghosts are part of the psyche, they need to be discussed, not in the sense of their materiality, but as their cyclic importance to individuals, and certainly they are, and they're part of this same dream and vision, visioning, functioning of the psyche, where our psyche is trying to give us messages. In both of my cases, where my brother came to me, um, they were basically him telling me that he was going to be all right. And I think that that was sort of the general gist of what my grandmother was saying to my grandfather back when he had his visions. Um, 
So then Dr. Jung started to talk about, um, oh, let's see here. Thomas says Dr. Oliver Sacks reports some of these hauntings in his wonderful book, Hallucinations. A sober person sees at the foot of their bed a recently deceased person who talks to them briefly. And um, uh, in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Dr. Young recounts a time when he was uh, dreaming and uh, a crucifix appeared at the foot of his bed. And um, I don't recall if he actually had a conversation uh, with Christ at that time or not, but he certainly did in the Red Book. Um, and so anyway, uh, Dr. Jung went on to talk about second sight, which is the ability to see something that's going on somewhere else. And um, he didn't, he didn't um, feel that this was an illness. He said that it is a gift and that if you don't accept it as a gift, then uh, otherwise every other gift is an illness too. And so all the portrait artists and painters and novelists and all those people um, are mentally ill as well, which they are not. And uh, so the ability to have a sense of what's going on in some other location or to get into someone else's mind um, is, is a gift. And it's a gift to people who are highly intelligent, um, highly intuitive, uh, not necessarily intelligent, but intuitive. And so this often happens with me uh, where I certainly can have a sense of what's going on in the mind of our president. It doesn't mean I can do anything about it, but uh, I certainly see things that uh, often come true very soon thereafter. And, um, you know, so, and I also see it in like my work colleagues, I can predict how a colleague is going to re, uh, reply to something that I do or how they'll react. And But you need intuition for that. And so if you don't have intuition, if you're, if you're a young man and it turns out that most of the people who watch these videos are young men between 18 and 34, as uh, you may or may not know. But uh, that being the case, um, it's possible that you will not have as developed an intuition as others. And so if that's the case, I recommend that you look at a book you can go find it in Barnes and Noble and just read this 40 pages, uh, which is uh, Women Who Run With the Wolves. And in that book, uh, you can find a um, story called uh, Vasilisa the Wise, which I think is on, starts on page 94, I believe, but it could be page 74. One of the two, I don't remember exactly which. But at the end of that story, uh, Dr. Clarissa Pincola Estes, who's a Jungian analyst in Colorado, uh, wrote about a 40 page dissertation on how women develop their intuition. And I found that quite profound when I first read it in the early 1990s, and I actually used it as a template for writing my novel. And so, um, or at least the first 24 chapters of my novel. And so it, if you are not uh, intuitively gifted, I would recommend that you go and learn about how you might get more intuition. Um, and unfortunately, because I am intuitively gifted, uh, much more so than the average man, uh, 
I really can't say whether it will help you or not. It certainly helped me, uh, but I'm, I'm uh, not an expert in these things, so you'll have to go and make your own judgment. Um, so, um, going back to Second Sight now, Dr. Jung was saying this isn't extraordinary that people have these abilities to see what's going on in another place or in another person's head, and um, countless individuals have prophetic anticipatory dreams, often banal. And so, um, you know, in my case, I can often uh, hear what people are thinking uh, in, in reaction to things that I say. And um, in the case of the Cirrus, she was actually seeing, able to see thoughts, uh, is the way Dr. Jung put it, it was that she was so intuitive and so introverted that she was actually able to see thoughts as if they were ghosts, and these ghosts were standing behind the actual physical people. And so she could see how the ghost, uh, you know, physical person would say something very nice with a big smile, and the ghost behind that person, of course, would be showing the uh, opposite side, the dark side of that, so would, would be talking about the the evil side of what was being said. Um, okay, my friend whose name I can't pronounce uh, says, uh, recently deceased persons come to me in my dreams just once right after they died. Uh, and I think that's an experience many people have. And the other experience that many people have is that at the time of death, um, they frequently have experiences like this, and it's uh, it's very common to have out of body experiences, and uh, so people who have uh, had near death experiences very often have out of body experiences, um, and so Michael Randall says, "Whoa, do you really hear people's thoughts? I swear, I have a couple of times before in the past. Uh, I definitely do." <laughs> I know what they're thinking, and um, uh, what what was um, I forget? I can't bring it up just now, but um, I I definitely um, I know what people are thinking, and I know from the other side of the world it doesn't matter. Time and space have no. Uh, meaning, and I'll get into that briefly here a little bit later. But anyway, um, Dr. Jung emphasizes that these uh, facilities are not extraordinary, and countless individuals have them, and they're often banal, which means that, you know, they're not a big deal. <laughs> okay, so now we get into um, the Cirrus's uh, mental health issue, and so the first symptom uh, was a sensitivity to light. And um, when patients come to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and they're unable to bear a clear consciousness, they shy away from clarity. And sometimes it's because they have a bad conscience and they fear being found out. And, you know, I would certainly um, think that you can see that very often. And, um, you know, when, when we see, um, you know, I hate to give the example, but I have to because it's the most um, prominent in our society right now is the uh, is the example of our president who is constantly blaming people even when there's no need to blame people <laughs> but he'll blame people anyway and uh, so it's very it's very evident that he 
is afraid of being found out about something. We don't know what it is, but I think we're about to find out. And, uh, and you know, whenever someone tries to blame another for something that's going wrong, chances are they're feeling very guilty inside. Um, how do you separate what they are thinking to projection? Well, certainly it's my projection of what they are thinking. Um, it, uh, I'm not saying that I get it um, extrasensorily per se. I'm seeing that saying that I get it intuitively based on all their tells, you know, their facial expressions, the way they talk and so on. So in the case of our president, for example, where uh, these days you're seeing uh, him, even though he's pretending things are coming from him, it's very obvious that he's uh, repeating um, bullet points that have been given to him by his staff. And he repeats them over and over again and in a very flat voice. And so you know that that's not him talking. And what you also know is, like last Saturday, apparently, he, he named Paradise California as Pleasure California, even though he was standing right there with the governor and the future governors of um, California. And so that was actually him talking. And so I think that, you know, what I'm seeing is that the White House staff is keeping him on Air Force One and far away so that he can do as little damage as possible, and, which was very obvious before the election, too, because uh, why do you go to Montana a day before uh, an election? Um, you know, there's a famous story about it in the election of 1960, uh, Richard Nixon had promised that he would go to every state during the election campaign. And three days before the election in 1960, uh, he chose to make a trip to Alaska, which he had not yet visited, instead of um, focusing on states that could really matter for him in the Electoral College. And some people claim that that uh, caused him to lose that election. Um, I certainly think that's a possibility. And when I see a politician going to someplace far, far away, I mean, on those couple of days before this year's election, we saw the president flying across the country uh, multiple times. So he was spending a lot of time in Air Force One. And uh, it was very clear that the powers that be in the GOP were just trying to keep him silence as much as possible. Um, and you can see that, um, you know, anytime you watch cable news on any of the channels these days, it's very obvious. Um, and so uh, on page 45, Dr. Young comments that it says this sensitivity to light He's talking about, he says, it's as if they had never been born completely and could consequently not trust this bright sunlit world sufficiently to be able to live in it. And um, we're seeing that in uh, the president, but I, I think you can see the functionality of how it happens uh, in the recent movie with Meryl Streep called uh, Florence Foster Jenkins. Uh, she was another privileged child who uh, was extremely wealthy and no one would say anything negative to her. And so as a result of that, she thought she could sing opera. And uh, she used to, her friends in the upper crust of New York society used to tolerate uh, her doing demonstrations of her opera prowess on many occasions, including at a annual 
event at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York, uh, and her husband very carefully prepared these events so that there would only be positive feedback. And uh, since she never had any uh, defeats, uh, she kept going and going until it got to the point where her husband um, booked Carnegie Hall for her to sing opera. And then he proceeded to give tickets to Marines and sailors who had just come back from World War II uh, to fill up the seats. And um, the, the review of her afterward, which she, he had tried to keep from her, but she finally became aware of the reviews, was pretty terrible. But the irony is that the that the recording of that event uh, apparently is the biggest selling item in the Carnegie Hall gift shop even to this day. And so I suppose we can expect the history books of this time in our country and its presidency to be uh, bestsellers for many years to come and many movies to be made about it once all the truth comes out. Um, uh, drama template says, how many hours a day do you spend reading? Uh, well, um, I'm, I don't only do reading, but I, I, I treat Dr. Young's work as more or less a full-time job. As most of you know, I'm retired now, so I have nothing uh, pressing to do at the moment. And... Um, and so as a result of that fact, I'm uh, spending my days, my wife is still working until next August, so I'm spending most of my days uh, studying Dr. Young's work. And the more I get into it, and the more I create videos for this channel, the more interesting it becomes for me. Uh, and to understand um, how I'm interacting with all of you, which is quite interesting as well. Um, and uh, so I think it would be quite common to say that I spend uh, six to eight hours a day working on the YouTube channel in one way or another. Maybe not all of it is reading, but I'm reading something in preparation for creating a video. And, um, and then... I'm trying to present things, uh, you know, as Dr. Jung was writing his books, he was allowing his unconscious to tell him this has to be done now. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, uh, I'm tripping through this colossal, uh, prodigious scholarship of Dr. Jung's, and it tells me, uh, what should go out and when it should go out, whether that's right or not. I don't know. I, you know, honestly, my, my physical body here in Annapolis, Maryland, doesn't have much, doesn't really have a dog in that fight, but my self, my unconscious self does have a dog in the fight and it's telling me what to do. Um, so Michael says, just one last question for now. So you don't hear in an extrasensory way. Do you believe in some sort of possibility of this kind of extrasensory thing, like hearing someone's thoughts? Well, I do believe in an extrasensory way, uh, Michael. I, I was, I hope I was clear earlier, but perhaps I wasn't that, um, that Dr. Jung was only saying about that particular time that that wasn't extrasensory. But uh, actually, later on in this, in these five lectures, he does talk about extrasensory perception as one of the things that goes on. And um, I can tell you that extrasensory perception is um, 
exceedingly common. And um, years ago, I would say probably 30 years ago now, it might be a little less, uh, my wife and I went to a weekend um, seminar on extrasensory perception, and I was just curious about it, and she was too. And what happened, it, it was quite a good event, and if you have never done it, uh, you probably should to experience it. But um, we did about, I would say, six or eight exercises during that two-day um, workshop. And what it demonstrated to me, as clear as a bell, is that extrasensory perception is everywhere, and it's exceedingly common. And um, this included things that was were physically happening to me at, at the time. And uh, I remember on, in, you know, we, uh, the, we were broken, broken into small groups, for example, and we were asked to say something about something I forget. It wasn't basically our re resume, and, but it was, you know, we were asked to, to read something like Mary Had a Little Lamb or something like that. And afterward, we were asked to talk about each of the person, persons in the small group. And, um, you know, I had one man who not only got my resume history uh, to a T, but he also predicted the next 30 years of my life, basically. I mean, he didn't know that, and I didn't know it at the time, but nonetheless, that's what happened in that day. And so I do believe that extrasensory per, uh, perception does work, and it works in very many ways that you cannot possibly comprehend, and no one has adequately researched it yet and what you can do with it yet. I mean, I think at the, this point, we're at the dilettante point where we know it works and we know it happens, <laughs> but we don't quite know how it works or how it can be used. I mean, maybe some people do, but not me. Um, but what I would say is that I definitely can hear other people thinking. Um, and, it, you know, it's just... It's just, um, it's not a question of belief, and it's not a question of a physical hearing. Um, it's just like Dr. Young says, I have no need to believe, I know. I just know what the, what the next sentence is going to be and, and what is going to happen in the next few weeks. I just know it. And... and uh, very often it happens, and th people think I'm nuts, but, um, you know, it's, in a way, it's a kind of, um, it's a kind of curse to be on the 99th percentile on the N scale on the Myers-Briggs type indicator. If you're that far out, then everyone else is farther toward the sensory scale, and so, um, it's so bad that I don't know what you don't know. I, I mean, unless you're out there with me, and I, I suspect that some of you uh, on this call are out there with me. I, I don't deny that. I assume that. Um, but uh, in my case, in dealing with anyone new, I don't know what they don't know, and I, I don't know... I have to really stop and think about how to express something to people so that uh, they'll understand what I'm talking about because my, what I know is so far beyond where they are. And as you can imagine in terms of talking with people who don't have much experience with Dr. Young's work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know the 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 concepts 
that Dr. Jung presented, like the concept of archetype and the concept of anima and those sorts of things. Well, you know, you can put those on a single page, but and you can read the definitions and you won't have a clue what it really means. The, you know, that's the thing. And you don't know anything about what's behind it. And what's happened to me is not only do I know what was written, but I have my own personal experiences that prove to me, uh, to my satisfaction, that what he was saying is true. And uh, I know it is true. It's not a question of believing. I know it's true. And um, so anyway, uh, Thomas says, I don't time the hours, but personally reading is an important way of gathering information, different from watching movies or surfing the net. Uh, I do spend a, a fair amount of time uh, watching television. I, I leave the evenings for my wife and I normally. Uh, the only exceptions are Monday night when I'm with you and Tuesday evenings I normally play bridge. Uh, which is a reconnection to my mother, who was a huge bridge player when I was growing up. Uh, but um, uh, besides that, um, I spend the evenings with my wife watching television, and as a result, our consciousnesses tend to meld together because we have the same inputs in the evening. That's what I believe. And, um, and so, you know, on, on Thursday, if you're sitting there watching some inane football game that you could care less who the players are, or who the teams are, but you're watching the football game and, oh, gee, maybe there'll be a good pass play. Well, your mind is melding with your fellow men in that case <laughs> and that's terrific but you know um, I think it's Comcast but it might be Verizon uh, that's doing this ad about being a professional football watcher or a professional basketball watcher as if that's a thing and it's not a thing the people that are actually having an authentic life are there on the court or down on the field, but the spectators aren't having an authentic experience. They're having a vicarious experience. And so this goes back to the dictum that's been very common in our society for 50 years, which is go out and get a life. Um, you know, if you haven't had a life and you don't have any experience, uh, you know, you can listen to some old geezer like me uh, for just so much and then you have to go out and get a life or Jordan Peterson for that matter. Jordan's not going to live your life for you. You have to go live it yourself. And um, Michael says, I swear I did I swear I did once. It was surreal. Uh, okay, I, I don't know what the experience you're referring to, Michael, there, but um, then Thomas says, the discussion of perceptions beyond the senses can't help but bring me bring to mind what in yoga philosophy are called siddhis, siddhis, uh, said to be developed as one progresses in yoga meditation practice. And I'm sure that that's true. I mean, I'm sure that uh, that is happening uh, across the world, especially in yoga. Um, and, you know, Dr. Jung wasn't terribly familiar with yoga as it's now presented in the West um, at the time that he lived. But, you know, I've actually written an article and done a video on the topic. They're yoga teachers in Nebraska. And oh, by the way, uh, <laughs> uh, they're changing uh, the way Americans, at least, and I think Europeans and Japanese, because I know uh, many Japanese are into yoga as well. Um, 
they are changing the way our minds work, very honestly. And uh, when I, my wife and I were actively doing it for a while until I had to uh, get a knee and an ankle replaced, which was sort of put a crimp in my yoga style. But, um, but you know, literally what our teacher was doing was teaching um, Hinduism. And, um, and so um, I'm not sure how many of the 30 or so other people in the class knew that. Uh, and I, Thomas, you're, you're the teacher, so you tell me, do, do your students typically know that you're teaching Hinduism <laughs> when you're doing a yoga class? I'm not sure. Uh, maybe they do. Um, and, uh, so it's in the fourth chapter of the Yoga Sutra of Pantajali, I have no doubt. Um, but, you know, I, I don't imagine that you fully disclose, unless it's a Kundalini class, maybe you disclose there, but... Um, Thomas says, I remember reading where Jung says he practiced for a short time back when he was delving into Kundalini. Um, yeah, and he did write a book on Kundalini, which I haven't read, so I, I have to acknowledge that I'm ignorant in that area. Um, and I, but I think that uh, what Dr. Jung ultimately did was a lot of meditation. And the reason that he created the house at Bonjan without running water and without electricity was that he wanted to put himself back into the frame of mind of a medieval person. And he once commented that if you visited him at Bonjan, uh, the only thing that would indicate that it was the 20th century at that time um, was the matches. Everything else was as it was in medieval times. And so he, he was doing a kind of meditation practice all the time that he was going to Bollingen. And that was for over 40 years. I mean, he started um, building that house, and I think he started building, actual building in 1923, and he physically, literally built the house around himself, um, and he physically built it himself as a meditation practice. So, um, and uh, actually I read something just this evening where he said, um, Sometimes I don't even know what my unconscious wants, so I go out and build something, and and my hands go ahead and build it. I don't. He doesn't think about. Didn't think about it. And after it's built, then he can go back and see what his unconscious was telling him. And I can certainly see the same. Uh, the same sort of thing happening in my own experience in terms of writing my novel, my poetry, uh, doing my paintings, all of that has been my hands teaching me what my unconscious is doing <laughs> and trying to do. Um, <clears throat> and so it's a... Thomas says, um, it can be less or more Hinduism, depending on the teacher, and there are various branches among Hindus. Tantra, for instance, and Tantra is also something that's uh, very common in Buddhism. Um, I'm just, well, and um, I'm, I'm really not going to start in on discussing Tantra. I mean, I, I've been exposed to it for 30 years, the stuff you see behind me, of course, is uh, my, my wife's material, but you can see that I live in a rather Buddhist household, and, um, uh, and we've discussed and 
gone through Tantra quite a bit. Um, Isaiah B. says there's a Greek genosco that translates to the Latin conocere, and it means a type of knowing through lived experience. That's very different from reading definitions of the anima, very definitely. And, um, you know, I made a, a sardonic comment the other day when I was reading about the Red Book, that it's, uh, it's uh, the Red Book described in words. Uh, and this comes down to my fundamental issue with Jordan Peterson, uh, which is he's all about the logos. And, and the things that we're talking about are all about the arrows. And you can, um, uh, you know, you can have a concept of something, and we have many concepts of things, but unless you put life into them, uh, they have no meaning whatsoever. So if I pull out my black book, which has embossed on the back of it, Holy Bible, uh, you know, that's just a, a, a doorstop until you put your your life into it, your uh, knowing or your belief or your experience into it. Uh, if you're going to practice uh, modern Christianity in any of its flavors, uh, and Thomas says, and there are forms of yoga, janana yoga, which have no physical aspect and are basically philosophical study of outer and inner, which is what Jungians do, right? Gnosis and Janana are related words. I have no doubt. I, I don't know that word directly, but um, I wouldn't dispute that boy. And I never felt as though I became a Hindu as I studied yoga. I took what I personally needed and didn't really get into worshiping Ganesha or Krishna or other aspects. And I, you know, I don't think that you need to get into worshiping those because uh, those are only other symbols of the self and presented in different dress. And so Dr. Jung was talking about his experience being the same experience as Jesus or uh, the Buddha or uh, the founder of Jainism or uh, Krishna or whatever it was that he knew what those experiences were and I think that you know I wouldn't say that I've had those experiences myself but I've had enough experiences uh, around his work that I believe him um, and it's not a question of believing in him I believe him when he says that he had those experiences. And I know enough to know that. And so interesting that Buddhism rose out of Hinduism roots in somewhat the same way that Christianity arose from Judaism roots, traveled from their place of origin and took root elsewhere, for example, Tibet and the US, very definitely. And uh, um, <clears throat> you know, the Dalai Lama has commented that maybe being exiled from Tibet was one of the best things that ever happened for Tibetan Buddhism because it caused uh, the Dharma to be spread around the world instead of being stuck up in Tibet because uh, I remember when I was in the ninth grade, we had a play at my junior high school called uh, Lost Horizon. And there was a movie at that time uh, called Lost Horizon, which was about um, Westerners going up into D Tibet. And they weren't saying specifically that they were talking to the Dalai Lama, but that's what they were doing. And so um, Thomas says, uh, it was interesting seeing similarities in the mythological pantheon of the two religions. Um, yes, that's true. Although Buddhism mainly wrote 
the thousands of Hindu gods out of the system. <laughs> and that's, that's why they split apart. But um, it really doesn't matter because we have, um, we have something like 400 sects of uh, Protestantism and at least uh, five in Catholicism, and that's what the Logos does. That's the sword that keeps uh, differentiating things and splitting things up, but you need something to pull them back together again also, and that's the issue that we have in the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis one another. Then, uh, I say, I says, Thomas, I never thought of it like that. Um, well, Isaiah, Dr. Jung's work is all about how similar all of our experiences are throughout the human race, uh, going back to earliest times that we're really the same person. And that's also uh, what this is about. So I'm going to go back to this talk for a little bit more. <clears throat> so anyway, there was... Um, There was nothing particularly unusual about her life until her marriage to Mr. Hauf. And on that same day, <clears throat> the local seminary priest died of natural causes. Now, he was not her same age, apparently. I think this priest is described as having been about 60 when he died. But... Uh, she was very affected by that and she couldn't she went to the funeral and she could not tear herself away from the grave and she saw the priest's hovering ghost over the gravesite and but thereafter she gave normal birth and <clears throat> then in february of 1822 so at this point she's 22 she dreamed of lying in bed with the dead priest. And she, in the dream, she heard her father and two doctors discussing her case. And and somebody, I, I forget who was talking here, but one of them was saying to leave her alone with the dead priest. And then she called out how well I am alone with this dead man, leave me alone. <clears throat> um, and then Dr. Young said that if she had come to his practice, uh, <clears throat> the same answer would mean that he could do nothing for her. Uh, if you step in and interfere, fate takes its revenge on you. And so he would not interfere, not the uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, what he observed was that she was becoming more and more deeply introverted, and so much so that she didn't want to face uh, physical life at all. And, um, and he said that the problem with the Cirrus was that she took sides with the dream. In other words, um, well, what he also said is she had identified more and more with the back world, introversion, and the dead, and she was dead to the physical world. And so he recommends not taking sides with a dream. He's saying, you know, you listen to the dream or you, you see the vision and then your ego has to think through what these things mean. And, um, and then he said the purpose of bringing this case forward in these lectures was to show the immense reality of the inner world. In other words, people at that time were not very um, up on psychology or what could happen. And meanwhile, they were still very much talking about uh, seances and 
you know, the wooey woo of tarot or what have you, uh, any div divination technique as a kind of magic. And um, so anyway, she he talks about how she became a kind of sonambulist and she retreated into this inner world. And it was uh, not empty madness. You don't know to you don't notice as long as all is well. Every and he says every child is born with a pre with predetermined assumptions of the world developed over eons. They're not tabula rasa, which he also said in his interview on BBC that children are not tabula rasa. They have a lot of things already there, uh, and. Um, he said, we must comprehend the world according to this inner disposition. So he was always very much in favor of having connection to instincts and to understanding what our instincts are doing. And, and one of the things that he was very upset about was that modern life has separated us so much for, from our instincts that we no longer know whether we're coming or going. Um, and uh, then he says, uh, the primitive is incapable of abstract thought. And that's what all of us have as abstract thought, because we're imagining as I'm speaking and, and you're reading the chat, you're envisioning other things that are more than just the physical right now presence. So, um, but what he was saying was that um, ghosts appear to primitives in projected form. They don't have abstract thought to think about it. And um, then in lecture six, uh, there's a quote, as, as soon as you take sides with a dream, it's, it assumes a fateful meaning. And so... I think that's the important quote for takeaway here, which is if you take sides with dreams, they're going to start having a fateful meaning on your life. And, um, and he didn't believe that the Cirrus would have come to him or any other psychologist. Uh, she would only come to the doctor for secondary ailments. And, um, and Dr. Uh, what was his name? The doctor who wrote this, Dr. Kenner, was it? Yeah, Kerner. And Dr. Kerner had come to her for secondary elements, not because of her mental health. And Dr. Young says that fate shows that she no longer desired to live and she actually converted the doctor to her belief and she turned toward the darkness and sometimes fate proves to be stronger and so this is what got dr kerner then uh, writing her story even though he wasn't a trained uh, psychoanalyst um, Thomas says, the triad of Hinduism, Krishna, Shiva, Vishnu parallels the Trinity. Some of the Hindu gods seem to have parallels in Greek myth, too. Curious stuff listening. Yes, very much so. Um, and so then there was a second question that came up at the beginning of, the, of lecture six, the second lecture. Uh, which uh, related to Kryptonesia and what that was. And specifically, it came up with regard to a uh, rabbit hunting trip, which is described in Nietzsche's Zarathustra. Uh, I'm looking at page 47 of this book, and tonight I'm working with this book, uh, The History of Modern Psychology by C.G. Jung. Now, what cryptonesia is, is 
thinking of something that you actually had experienced before, but you don't remember it. So um, there's in uh, Zarathustra, there's this scene where um, where uh, some people on a ship um, go ashore to hunt rabbits. And while they're there, two creatures, one of whom is Zarathustra himself, come across the sky uh, as dark eminences, and they go into a volcano. And what Jung is pointing out is that that same scene appeared in the ship's log of a ship called the Sphinx, that uh, from eight, uh, sorry, from 1686. And uh, the image was of two men who were recognized by the crew, the hunting party that went ashore that day. And they were uh, on uh, Sicily, or I'm sorry, in Italy. And they were at Stromboli and the two men came across the sky and went down in a, in a volcano and, um, and then um, it was learned that the two people who were recognized as coming across the sky actually were acquaintances who uh, lived in London and they had both died on the same day. And, um, and it turned out that Justinus Kerner uh, had mentioned this in his writings. And, um, and, so, and it also turned out that Dr. Young uh, had read it in, um, his, in the library at the University of Basel in 1898. He had read, read this ship's log from the Sphinx. Uh, but I think because he was reading Justinus Kerner's book that mentions it. And so he wrote to um, Nietzsche's sister and asked her if he had ever been uh, exposed to the ship's log. And uh, she acknowledged that he had been exposed to it. So it wasn't a question of Nietzsche plagiarizing, but this idea of this event occurring in uh, his book Zarathustra um, was a was cryptonesia. That is what Dr. Young is saying, and uh, what Dr. Young's further point is that when you hit upon a classical idea. Uh, which is, um, you know, you may not, not know it's a classical idea, but it connects, it creates associations with all sorts of material that's in your unconscious, and you may or may not know it consciously or half consciously. And uh, what he says that it's dead certain that ghosts and similar phenomena are things we experience from within. So, you know, ghosts are real, they're, but they're real in the psyche, not in the physical world. And so then he goes on to talk about clairvoyance. And, wow, this is going to be hard to get through this. Um, and in clairvoyance, he's mentioning uh, various divination techniques, and the one I know something about is the Tarot, although Dr. Jung doesn't mention the Tarot here, um, but um, what happens in the Tarot isn't perceived by sensory organs per se, and um, the Cirrus in this case is only seen by being in an exceptional state and what happens and but Dr. Jung describes this consciousness as like a spider's web okay and uh, it attracts things like a spider's web does uh, I call it a, something a little differently I talk about hooks 
in the unconscious, but the, the point is that um, the Tarot has 78 degrees of wisdom, so there are 22 major arcana cards, which are archetypal cards, and everyone experiences all of these cards. And then there are 56 uh, cards, which are based on four suits, 14 in each suit, cups, coins, wands, and swords. And those suits represent, uh, or those cards represent things that happen to you around those issues. And so cups is typically emotional items, coins is typically sensory items, wands are typically um, natural or intuitive items, and swords are um, thinking items. Okay, so it also relates to the Myers-Briggs type indicator. And if you're not aware of it, there are, I think I did 18 videos earlier, and there's a video playlist about how to read the Tarot if you're ever interested. But the point, my point is that there's nothing um, occult about reading the Tarot. It simply was not uh, known, understood before, but this is the same for any um, divination technique. So it can be reading tea leaves or the Ouija or whatever else you choose to name. But what happens is, and it, it relates also to astrology. So it, it doesn't matter what I as a tarot reader say, because your unconscious has this spider's web, as Dr. Jung's metaphor has it, and it catches the things that relate to you. And, or as I say, um, you know, the hooks are open and, and your psyche is ready for the things that I say. So my point is that I can go into an auditorium with a thousand people. I can throw the cards across the stage in no specific layout. And I can simply walk across the stage and read the cards as I wish, just randomly. And whatever I do, the, what, however I do that, everyone in the auditorium will think that I did a reading for them. They will hear a different reading. Every person will hear a different reading because every person in the auditorium has a different spider web. They're waiting. And so those words come out and they connect to you in a different way than the person sitting next to you. So if I see the Empress card and I read that as mother, everybody's got a mother. And if you have something going on with your mother right now, then mother is going to relate to you and you're going to take that in as part of the reading. It's going to catch in your spider web. But if, um, if there's nothing special about your mother, your psyche won't catch that and it'll pass through the spider's web. But I'll say something else because these 78 degrees of wisdom will definitely catch something in your psyche as I do the reading. And so if you're, if you want to have more interest in that, what I, what I call that is moving the furniture around in your psyche. So if you want to understand what you're thinking about and so on, you can learn, I mean, what your unconscious is thinking about, you can learn to read the Tarot and that will start to uh, teach you a lot about yourself. It's, uh, let's call it low-cost psychotherapy. <laughs> it's not psychotherapy, but it definitely does make you more aware of yourself. Um, and Thomas says, well, bugs and bunnies meet Zarathustra, absolutely. Okay, uh, going on. So uh, Dr. Jung is talking about how you can get an intuition. For example, uh, you have an intuition that a house is a, a blaze and the uh, house in your vision isn't your house, but 
actually it turns out that it is your house that's burning. Um, and so we project every day shamelessly. We like to see our devils on the other side of the river. And so uh, the seeress definitely wanted her devils outside. And in the course, I'm going to show you in a minute here, um, a mandala that uh, the seeress developed with Dr. Kerner uh, in one of her meetings with her. There it is. I'll show it briefly and then I'm going to come back to it. Uh, but this is basically an image of the seeress's perception of her inner world as she described it. And it's uh, extremely complex, as you can see, but everybody else is outside of that world. That's her inner world there. And the point is that we all have an inner world like that. Okay, now I'm going to bring that back after a while, but I just wanted you to be aware that it's coming. And so, um, so anyway, um, the seeress wants everyone else outside of that circle. And uh, she dreamed that she would recover her health from the other side, from the inner self, um, in the background, in the unconscious. And Dr. Jung regarded that as very ominous, as Dr. Jung would doubt anything could be done with a patient like that. And uh, what he said about this, it may seem crass to us today, but he said, you can't heal at the expense of your own health. It's not worth it. And, um, and at one point she was talking about your body um, mimics what's going on in your psyche. And she talks about how uh, her heart stood still and it's interesting that when I was 19, I had an affliction, which the doctors called extrasystoles. And um, what they said was that this is normal and, and what it is is extra heartbeats or it's a heartbeat where your heart is beating along and then your heart fills up more largely with blood one time and sort of stops for an extra half second, and then it shoots blood out again. And so it feels like your heart is jumping in your, in your chest. And at that, at that time, <clears throat> um, you know, there was a lot going on around my life and around uh, uh, the Vietnam War and so on. And so I don't, really remember what might have been going on in my psyche at that time, but I do remember these extra heartbeats, which I actually uh, went to see a doctor at Keesler, or not, not at Keesler, but at uh, Griffiths uh, Air Force Base one time. And, you know, they hooked me up to the EKG and said, yep, you got it. Um, but they never connected up that there might have been some unconscious psychological aspect of that. You know, later on, um, you know, a couple of years later, the Marine Corps tested me, said, you're good to go to Vietnam as a Marine. <laughs> and so it wasn't obviously uh, very life-threatening in any way, but nonetheless, it was an experience and it, you know, it could uh, relate to the body mimicking these um, internal ideas. Okay. Um, so then in lecture seven, uh, Dr. Young is talking about, uh, December, this is December 1st, 1933. Uh, he was talking about mediumistic phenomena. Um, and uh, he said, really, this is parapsychology, but it does exist. And so therefore, it's psychologically important. And um, there, many people do have synambulistic occurrences and consciousness uh, slips away. And uh, 
And what Dr. Young said, it was very, there was very high usage of psychic energy to be able to uh, stay in this state uh, where she was aware of these various uh, levels in her unconscious. And so fundamentally that was killing her, um, is the way I read it. And, um, and he pointed out that in these synomulistic states, you can have visions and hallucinations and you can, for example, fear of, feel a mass of fire in your body or something like that. And what he says is that visions are symbolic of nature. They happen in ordinary neuroses as well. And he talked about um, autoscopy, which is this um, body or the psyche leaving the body uh, exteriorized images of herself also happen to seriously ill and dying patients where you have out of body experiences he called this autoscopy here and um, he said at this point uh, her eye affliction recurred and she focused on the inner light and so she focused inward and so she started to see ghosts, etc. And it was at this point that she was seeing ghosts standing behind the others. So uh, if you could imagine this, if, if you're looking at me, you could see me doing my talking in my physical world and behind me, there's this ghost saying the opposite or holding fingers up behind my head or something like that, which would represent my uh, shadow. <laughs> but anyway, she, she could physically see these thoughts. He called them thoughts that she could see. And um, he commented about how uh, she started to be uh, non-submersible in in the bathtub. They couldn't keep her body parts under the water, her, the people that were working with her. Um, and he, he reminded about the, the witches in Switzerland who, uh, if they would tie them up and throw them in the water, and uh, if they floated to the top, then they definitely knew they were witches. If they didn't float to the top, then they weren't witches. But, oh, by the way, you're still drowned. <laughs> and um, so then there's also an affinity to stones and minerals. And uh, some of you may remember, and if you go to a, a new agey type uh, exhibition even today you can find people selling uh, gemstones and crystals and um, this is a, a faculty that we really don't know too much about but I have some experience with it and uh, so let me just mention that all of these stones uh, contain different vibrations and all of you must have heard something about crystal sets, so-called. Okay, so crystal sets were earlier radios. And when I was a Cub Scout, I had a kit that I could put together in a little box. And I had a crystal and it had a, a pin that, that went down and it touched the crystal. And it reached a certain frequency in that crystal and it could connect um, with radio waves and actually play a radial signal uh, through my crystal set. And so that's the way crystals work. They can receive uh, different, um, different vibrations or different frequencies. And, um, you know, in early radios, that's how you change the channel is through the crystal set. Um, and I had a specific experience with this um, with an amethyst, which is a stone that is supposed to be good for healing. And when my brother died, I had this 
amethyst that was shaped in the in the shape of a heart and this amethyst was green in color and the story was that if you put this amethyst in the in the palm of your hand um, that the vibrations would calm you down and so at the time my brother was undergoing under went actually three liver transplants in a period of 10 weeks and um, he did this at uh, Presbyterian Hospital in Pittsburgh which is a five-hour drive from where I live and so I made in that 10-week period I made quite a number of trips up to Pittsburgh and I remember uh, I, you know sometimes I would get I would be getting more and more tense because I was aware of the uh, oncoming death of my brother or um, at first it, things looked good the, for after the first liver transplant uh, but then that transplant failed and um, then things were downhill from there but I just remember my tension and the fact that if I had this crystal in my palm um, that the vibrations would uh, calm me down and be healing for me from a psychological point of view but if I took the crystal out of my hand and set it aside um, then my tension would go up and up and up I could feel it happening because it was so intense at that time and then I would put the crystal back in my hand and lo and behold I would become less tense and so my tension rate would come down 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 and um, so what I can say from my own experience is that um, you know crystals and gemstones do work in some way I don't know how but I have the experience that they do work uh, from personal experience both from the crystal set that I made as a Cub Scout so that I could listen to the radio uh, when I was 10 years old or something and uh, also from this experience with the amethyst uh, but also by tradition uh, when you don't need that uh, device anymore whatever it is in my case the amethyst uh, by tradition it will leave you and sure enough uh, the day I didn't need it anymore it simply disappeared I thought I dropped it down in um, in the space between my car seat and the, and the middle section of my car uh, but I never could find it again so it left me and um, so anyway then he's talking about um, mirrors and crystal balls and seeing events in the past present and future and how some people can actually hypnotize themselves some readers hypnotize themselves and um, and then they can do divination and um, what he says is what such people see if anything at all are of course processes from their own unconscious and um, and then he talks about how um, how there was something that they were doing with blowing bubbles with the cirrus and she could see things that were happening outside the building and she could see something that was actually happening with the doctor's wife and the doctor went home uh, and sure enough that was happening with his wife at that time and uh, Dr. Jung mentions the famous looking into water scene uh, the scene in the Karaf from Dumas's, uh, Dumas's um, book Joseph Balsamo and he talks about the seance that was involved there and um, then the doctor talks about pieces of paper and he said that uh, she could recognize things through the pit of her stomach and so um, 
he wrote on two pieces of paper that he folded identically. On one he wrote, there is no God, and on the other he wrote, there is a God. And um, he gave this to, gave these two to the seeress five times. And each time she said that uh, one felt like a void and the other felt like a sensation, like something was happening. And they, in every case, they came true. Um, this, the same piece of paper opened each time. And I, I don't know whether it was, there is no God or there is a God. Uh, Dr. Jung didn't say. Uh, but he also mentioned William James's Mr. Pipe, Mrs. Piper, who was William James's uh, medium. And she was one of these uh, people who would put on her forehead an envelope or something, and then she would predict something. And um, so supposedly that only works if the person you're reading about is still alive. Um, and so sure enough, one of Mrs. Piper's friends wrote something um, for her that was put in a safe deposit box for after her friend's death. And then it was brought to Mrs. Piper and she thought about it a lot. And then she came out and said what it was and they opened it and it wasn't anything like that. And so sometimes these things uh, don't connect or they connect badly. And one example is uh, experience that James Michener had. James Michener um, used to do uh, this type of medium work uh, at uh, county fairs just for fun. Uh, when there was a county fair in an area where uh, Mr. Michener, the famous novelist, was, uh, he would go and take a booth and do readings for people. And um, he had a lot of fun with that, and people, I'm sure, enjoyed it. But then one day, um, he did a reading for a young man, uh, which very much disturbed that young man. And he went out of the county fair and was immediately in an auto accident and killed. And so after that, James Michener didn't do any more readings at county fairs. Um, well, let's see if I can find this uh, vision in the sun's fear. I may put this off until next time. Um, So what we've come to now, and it's almost 10 o'clock, so I think that I'm going to leave this for next week because this gets rather complicated, um, but the discussion of this mandala uh, is here, and let me see if I can find kind of the summary. Um, so I'll come back to this mandala next week. And, um, but I wanted to, um, go on, uh, to a, a sort of semi summary about what's going on here. Uh, and we, parts of this we haven't gotten to yet. And, um, so in lecture 10, which is after he's given the five lectures on the Cirrus, he says that whenever introversion intensifies, the three phenomena I mentioned become apparent. Okay, one is time and space become relative. Uh, presentments and dreams come true and telepathic experience occurs. Two, we find certain autonomous psychic contents ultimately leading to personifications and the apparition of ghosts. And three, um, 
symbols of the psychic center are experienced. This center does not coincide with consciousness and is generally perceived as a source of life equivalent to the experience of God. One can recognize therein the essence of religion. And um, let's see. So then he's, he goes back through that. But anyway, those three things are three things that we were supposed to take out of uh, the Cirrus of Provorst. And next week I will get more thoroughly into uh, the end of this. And uh, as you see, uh, there was a reference to this, to the mandala that she was uh, a part of. And what she found is that she could not get out of the center of this mandala, among other things. And very shortly thereafter, she died. Um, and so uh, I will start with this next week. And um, I'll read some of your comments. And then I'm going to bring this evening to a close because we've been at it for two hours here. Um, but um, there is a fair amount more to discuss here. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, listen, listen and respond to your comments uh, both next week and thereafter. Uh, what I would suggest is that if you have comments or comments come to mind over the coming holiday, uh, you create um, a text file that has um, 200 character blivets of your ideas or the story that you want to tell, which you can then cut and paste and put into the chat as we go through the evening. That might expedite things for you so you don't have to type it all in chat as we go. Um, and so you might be able to prepare in advance for that. And if you look in the Dropbox in the folder 11, um, and you'll see it also has the series of Provorst on it. If you look in that folder, subfolder in the Dropbox, you will find uh, the complete set of my notes for this evening, including the part I haven't gotten to. And, um, uh, and also uh, some other handouts, including uh, the, uh, the mandala. Okay, so um, Thomas says, as Hamlet said to his college pal, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in our philosophy. And I can't help but wonder what an extreme extrovert's mystic vision would be as opposed to the Sirius's visions. Okay, I'm going to see if I can give that to you um, because I think I know what the answer to that is. And uh, I'm going to see if I can bring it up. Let me, I'm just hoping that it's going to be in the place I hope it is, because if it's not, it may be hard to find. Ah, yes, here it is. I have to cut down the size of this vid image. Okay, so this is why Dr. Young, I'm starting to understand why Dr. Young said that we Americans are extreme extroverts. And uh, this is why. Okay, this is a scene in the marina outside my house. And so this is what an extreme extrovert thinks of as... Uh, God or something to dream about. So this is a 63-foot power yacht uh, called Never Enough. 
and so an extreme extrovert uh, is trying to show everything he has, whether it's a Mercedes or a 63-foot yacht or uh, he, this one obviously thinks that he wants even a bigger yacht. I remember when I bought a small yacht, um, I, my partner and I, the person I bought it with and I uh, said, uh, we need a bigger boat. And, and of course that need for a bigger boat never ends. And so, um, an extreme extrovert who wants to show his value to the world uh, will uh, be showing the things that he has. And of course, those things won't have made him happy. Um, but nonetheless, that's uh, what, he, what he was pursuing. So he, at least I suppose he might think he's happy because he has this boat. But as I would uh, point out to you, the famous um, quote about a boat, which is um, uh, the best days of owning a boat are the day you get it and the day you sell it. <laughs> Everything else is it's just a hole in the water that uh, into which you throw money. Um, but anyway, uh, that's the dream. I, I'm being a little facetious here, but I, I do think that that sort of represents the dream of a supreme, of a extreme extrovert. Um, and, uh, so I don't know. I, I welcome any other thoughts on that either tonight or next week, but anyway, that's my um, thought. Um, and, uh, Thomas just laughed at what I showed him the boat. Perhaps the extra extrovert would mistake paradise for pleasure. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, our president is, um, is a complete example of uh, that. He he thinks that because he has Trump Tower and and golden toilet seats and so on that everything is hunky dory. But you know, I don't know if anybody else has noticed, but I certainly have noticed that he doesn't seem to think that he he doesn't seem to be having too much fun as president a lot less than any other president i've ever seen so um but that's my observation um and, and so uh, my friend from uh, scandinavia uh, from norway i think uh, whose name i cannot pronounce uh, why did you feel that the use of the boat was ironic? I'm, I'm just curious if you're still with us, you could comment on that. Um, anyway, okay, so we're all going to, we in America are going to have what I consider to be our most sacred holiday, which is the Thanksgiving holiday. And so I wish all my American friends happy Thanksgiving. And I hope, I hope you have a lovely week, weekend, or a lovely Thursday at least with your families, wherever they are in the world. Um, I'm going to be blessed by being with my nine grandchildren all in one place. Uh, I think for the first time, definitely for the first time. I mean, I've been with them all, but uh, I think this is the first time I've had them all in the same place. And uh, my friend said, I thought you meant that the boat owner had named it out of irony. Um, yeah, but I think unconscious, I, I do agree that he named it out of irony. Um, but I think that um, unconsciously, that's how he really feels also. And that's, uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it.
I don't know. If anybody else has thoughts on this, I'd be happy to hear them either by email or whatever. Um, and so, uh, and if you are not a member of our Dropbox, please send an email to skip.conover at gmail.com and I will make you a member. You have to send it through a normal email network, though, something like Gmail, um, not through Facebook and not through... Um, well, you can send me the address through Twitter, um, but I, I need... And you can send your normal email address through Facebook, but I have to know what your regular email address is, and that's a requirement of Dropbox. It's not my requirement. And um, we have a lot of very happy uh, or very valuable items in that Dropbox. And uh, I do not talk about it. I don't talk about the contents of that Dropbox or of the advanced reading group Dropbox uh, on video. Uh, but you will have to... Uh, uh, look and see for yourself what's there. Uh, Isaiah, I didn't, uh, when did you send me the email? I don't remember seeing an email from you, so if you would resend it to me, uh, please, I will uh, make the necessary change. Um, I'm sorry, I, some, I get about between two and four hundred emails a day, and I do my best to sort through them and a quick as quick of a way as I can, but it doesn't always get done all that quickly. Um, most of them are junk emails, which I don't look at. For example, I get a colossal number of notifications from Twitter, which mostly I ignore. But anyway, Thomas. Okay, um, so Thomas, uh, the chat picked that up as, as uh, for me to monitor. So I'm not going to prove. I'm not going to show the show it so that I don't um, show your email address. Uh, but I will write write your email address down uh, so that I have it and. Uh, and then I will add you. And so if uh, Isaiah, if you, apparently the system will do the same thing for you. If you just put your email address right here in the chat, I will not show it to other members on the chat, uh, but I will write your email address down so that I can uh, and then add you. Um, Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, Thomas, I've gotten yours, and thank you for your wishes for Thanksgiving. And uh, Isaiah, if you will somehow get your uh, email address to me, um, I will add you as well. And uh, Thomas, I'll get yours through you, to you to, tonight. Um, and okay, I see Isaiah, so I'm going to write that down before I log off here. Okay, so I've got them both. Um, Isaiah and uh, Thomas, uh, shortly after I discontinue this, uh, you, you will receive an invite uh, from... Um, you, you'll receive both an invite from Dropbox and an email from me giving you the way to... the link 
so you can connect without actually joining um, Dropbox. Uh, so wait for the regular email from me, which will give you access to the Dropbox without paying, I believe. Uh, but you will also get the invite from uh, Dropbox uh, within the hour. So, um, yes, uh, Thomas, the answer to that is yes, the chat weeds out emails and hyperlinks. And so I'm not showing yours or I, Isaiah's email addresses. That's for you to do if you wish to. Um, and... Uh, Thomas says, I'm going to write about the holiday separation of men and women as seen by the children. Thanks for that inspiration. That's a good idea. Um, I've been thinking about writing that essay for 30 years, or maybe more, maybe 40, 50 years. But anyway, um, so anyway, I'm going to log off. I will mark this video for... Um, playback, but it does take a few minutes for YouTube to get its act together before it starts to play. So I'll see you next week at the same time, Monday at 8 p.m. And if you're an advanced reading group member, um, there will be no session this week due to the holiday, and our next session will be a week from Wednesday. So I look forward to seeing you then. Talk to you soon. Bye.